I know so many, particularly female supervisors and managers who are taking medication so they can absorb more stress. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that because I was talking to some of my girlfriends and I was like, wow, like I didn't do that, which is probably why part of the reason it was so hard on me, <laughs> yes. but I just suffered it. And I don't know why I chose that instead of taking medication, but I have many friends who did. And then I kind of thought to myself, isn't it interesting that, that in many cases we will medicate ourselves to, to stress ourselves so we can tolerate more stress. Hey there, my name's Ashley Church. And I'm Erin West. We were once newly promoted crime scene and latent print supervisors on mutual struggle buses as we both simultaneously tried to navigate through the challenges within our forensic units. Now we run a business where we create tools and resources that we wish we had had to make these transitions easier. We like to talk about the experiences we've had in the forensic field, the good, the bad, and the ugly, in the hopes to create awareness around these issues and move the needle forward to create positive change in the forensic community. So if you're a forensic professional, regardless of your years of experience, who's not afraid to dive into real, raw, and sometimes uncomfortable topics, you're in the right place. This is the Forensics Unfiltered Podcast. We've got another guest interview from our virtual summit for you. Last September, we hosted a free four-day event titled Forensic Supervisor Success Summit, designed to help you thrive in a forensic supervisory position by setting goals, optimizing resources and skills, and getting organized. 768 registrants from 38 states and 14 countries were able to learn from 28 speakers and listen to 32 presentations. It was so wildly successful that we plan on hosting another summit this year. But while we're preparing for the big event, we wanted to give you something to listen to while you wait. So every month this summer, we'll be featuring a presentation from the 2022 Forensic Supervisor Success Summit. On this bonus episode, we'll be kicking things off with a guest interview with Sean Henderson titled Creating an Outstanding Unit Culture. Sean established Evidence Management Institute in partnership with Tracker Products. Evidence Management Institute offers training classes, online certifications, as well as auditing and consulting services. And if you love this episode, we know you'll love the other presentations too. The presentations featured on Forensics Unfiltered make up only 15% of the entire summit. You can get instant access to replays for all 32 presentations in the All Access Pass on gapscience.teachable.com. We'll include all of the links in the show notes, but again, you can go to gapscience.teachable.com and click on the All Access Pass. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy. All right. Hi, guys. I'm Erin West with Gap Science, and we are so excited to have Alice White here with us today. So, hi. Before we dive into the topic at hand, which we're really, really excited to have you guys hear about, uh, I'm going to give Alice a minute to tell us about her background in forensics and how she came to be a forensic supervisor uh, over the course of her career. Good morning, everyone. Well, I don't know what time of day you're watching this, but for me right now, it's Saturday morning. <laughs> so I'll say good morning anyway. <laughs> my name is Alice White, and um, I actually started my career in the state crime lab in Alaska. So my journey kind of goes from one side of the country to the other. I was born and raised in Maryland. I went to college and got a Bachelor of Science degree in biology. But of course, I graduated many moons ago. But in the transition of completing college, I actually transferred from St. Mary's College in Southern Maryland, which is where I started, to the University of Alaska Anchorage, which is where I finished. So that was a big transition. So I finished college. And as many of you know, when you have a bachelor's degree in biology, your options are kind of limited. Um, mostly, you know, you go on to graduate school and you get into research or medicine or something like that. And that wasn't on my agenda, <clears throat> mainly because I had my daughter while I was in college. 
So basically I had to get a job. I started applying to every lab in town in order to find something that was full-time with benefits and could pay the bills basically. And uh, through that process out of sort of really nowhere, because at the time back in, you know, the late 1990s, no one was really talking about forensic science. You know, there was lots of police shows, but there really wasn't anything about forensic science in my world. So I didn't really know anything about it. But I happened to land a trainee position with the state crime lab in Alaska. And in that position, I worked crime scenes across the state. So we only went out for homicides. So I literally cut my teeth as a crime scene investigator working homicides. And also I was learning uh, latent prints uh, inside for the laboratory side of it. So about four years in and having a second baby as married at the time, we moved to the Las Vegas area. And I started as a, so in Alaska, I was a latent print examiner who just happened to do crime scenes. When I first got to the Las Vegas Valley, I worked for Henderson Police Department and I was a crime scene analyst who also did latents. So different, different title, but same role. And of course, in Henderson, the desert, it's hot. Alaska wasn't. Uh, it was a whole different array of experiences, we'll say. <laughs> All different array of experiences. Plus, I had to work other types of scenes I wasn't used to. So, for instance, in Alaska, the majority of the scenes were homicides. When I got to the Las Vegas Valley, I was working suicides for the first time. And it was a very unexpected thing. And it's a different sort of mental reaction to that. It's a very eerie scene to work. I found that suicides were much eerier, like got under my skin a little bit more than homicides. I also had to work SIDS deaths. And that again was something I wasn't used to. And as well, when we would respond to a scene of an inf sudden infant death syndrome, the family would still be like in the house, like mm -hmm. crying and wailing <laughs> and you're like so hard to like, oh man. And <laughs> that's not something I was used to having to deal with. When I was in Alaska, I didn't have to work autopsy. That wasn't part of my job at all. But I did have to work the all work with the, you know, when they were doing the autopsy, I had to be on stamp. I had to disrobe the victims. I had to collect evidence and everything else. And again, something that I didn't realize I'd signed up for. So when, you know, you have enough scenes that are just emotionally not quite what you were prepared for, because, you know, you get your first job in, in forensics and you think, oh, this is the job. This is what this entails. Then you go to another agency and all of a sudden you have vastly different, you know, <laughs> vastly very different. different. <laughs> Woo! And then you're like, oh, 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 I see. Things are different here. And I realized I really loved the lab work. <laughs> and I really loved getting sleep. So in Alaska, we got called out like every two months we went out to a scene. So maybe every two months I went without sleep for a few days. But in Henderson, my partner Maria and I, we were it. We did all the latents and mostly all the crime scenes. We had one other person that helped out, but really it was just the two of us. So we were on call constantly. And mm -hmm. I would go to scene after scene after scene. I'd be three, four days, hardly any sleep. I was becoming dysfunctional. I almost, I ran a red light and like almost got into a really bad accident because I was exhausted. Yep. I would have dispatch on the phone with me the whole drive home in my ear so that I was safe to drive. And, you know, this was in the early 2000s. So things were just like, I was like, oh man, this is, this is not what I signed up for. We have way too much work and it was overwhelming. And I still had to do latents in the lab. So, you know, you're yes. exhausted and you're coming in and you're having, and the, but this is water, by the way, just for the record. Um, <laughs> I'm sure that there's yeah. many supervisors watching right now that are in yeah. the same journey. <laughs> It's like, I was like, let me just go back in the lab. Like, I will let go of the on-call pay. I will let go of the overtime. I don't want any of it because I had a, two small kids at home. So, yes. you know, and I would like come in at, you know, three in the morning and fall asleep for three hours and they were up bouncing around the house. And, you know, it was just like, no. So I went, uh, hopped over to Las Vegas Metro Police Department and still, you know, same pay, basically same title, but now just late print examiner and no crime scene responsibilities, which was fantastic. So I had, you know, a regular schedule, a regular job, like I just was a worker bee to show up, do my job and go home. And whoo, those were stress-free days. But, you know, 
that's never good enough. So what happened? <laughs> yes. Then you decided I'll go for supervisor. <laughs> so at the time, we were all in one section under one manager. And so he was a firearms examiner, was his history. And he managed uh, footwear, tire track, latent prints, and firearms. And when myself and Vicky got hired on, we were the only two women in the unit. And we grew from six to eight examiners. So that was in 2002. So when we got up to eight examiners, then we moved buildings. We got into a new building and they were going to hire more, but they were also like reclassifying all the job specs. So they're going through this huge reclassification of the job description titles because at the time we didn't hire trainees and they wanted to start including trainees. So the lab is undergoing this massive upheaval as we, you know, switch to ISO accreditation, we're moving into a new building, we're adding and changing everyone's job descriptions. But before they did that, they decided to open a manager position to segregate latents off from the rest of the comparative discipline. So they left Tori over the rest of it and they pulled latents off to the side and created a new manager position. Mm -hmm. And then it became like, I was the baby of the unit. So I had the least number of years experience. I was the youngest person in the unit at the time. And we didn't know what the future held for us. And we were very concerned about who was going to potentially come in from the outside. And so I was encouraged to go ahead and just put in for it to sort of keep some stability within the section. So I did and I got it. <laughs> so, you know, that's how I landed where I am. That was a very long story. <laughs> All good. But that's so, and then how long were you responsible for supervising at Las Vegas? So at that role, so I started in 2006 and I started in like, I think it was like middle of the year, 2006. And then I started my company <laughs> at the end of 2006. So I became a manager over the units and I became an independent business contract instructor the same year. And I did both while raising a family up until I retired. I retired from Metro, but not from this. In <laughs> uh, yeah, in uh, January 2018. So it was about many 12, years. 12 and a half years. I did both. I was hustling. Many, many years. That is hustling for sure. Mm. So I know that I took one of your classes um, many years ago and you had talked about kind of a story that kind of was the culmination of many, many years of burning the wick at all ends, where you finally made the decision where you're like, you know what, it's time I'm going to go ahead and retire. And I think we have a lot of supervisors that are kind of sit that fence where they're like, when is it time? When is it finally time for me to go? I'm, I'm not really happy here. It's affecting my mental health. Like, how do I make the decision to go? So if you'd be willing to share, mm -hmm. you know, what kind of factors helped you make the decision where you're like, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and do Evolve Forensics full time and kind of step away from this supervisory role. Right. So it was a confluence of several things that actually were going on at the time. So, of course, in law enforcement, you have an ever changing. So it seems like for the lab, which we were civilian up through the lab director. So my boss was the lab director. That hierarchy tended to be quite stable and change usually was very slow. Right. So if someone retired, it was usually someone in the system, you know, promotes up, you kind of know them, you already have relationships with these people and there's more stability in the process within the structure. What, what I found was in the structure of the civilian laboratory. However, there was a person above them in the Las Vegas system who was a captain and that position tended to rotate out rather quickly. And so that position you had someone coming in who kind of just had to do their time oftentimes they had to like because you know they they would rotate them through each section of the department so that they would get experiences mm -hmm. in all the various sections of the agency we were a huge agency and all of that was so they could go on and do the next thing because they were going for yeah. promotions and <laughs> other other things in their future but we didn't leave we don't rotate we don't go anywhere so this is our life but you have people coming in that this isn't their life. This is just mm -hmm. a temporary stop on the way. 
So they come in with their own preconceived notions with not um, necessarily understanding the rules. I actually had one of them say to me, you guys in the lab, you're so rule driven. I was like, <laughs> there is a reason why. <laughs> So <laughs> I was like, wow. So they didn't quite understand like how structured, I mean, you talk about paramilitary, you would think the policing side of it, the paramilitary side of it, they are, but only in certain situations. In the lab, yeah. we're that way all the time. Like we are yep. very rule driven, policy procedure driven because we have to be because of the court challenges. It's expert testimony is just different. And because of it being so different, we are much more, you know, and accreditation requirements, all of that, like we are way more OCD about that stuff. So I realized that certain personalities at that level, I could manage if they just let me do my job, I was fine, because I know how to do my job, just trust me to do my job, you're paying me really good money to do this job. But other personalities weren't quite so like they wanted to get into the middle of things and often could sometimes be somewhat destructive or disruptive to the process. Yeah. So my very first run as manager, my first couple years, we had someone who was very disruptive. I mean, it was really bad. And during that time, I survived it. I got through it. They left. They were eventually fired. But because of the way things go, they also got their job back and then left again. But <laughs> never back never back in the lab. So as yeah. long as he stayed away from me, I was fine. And we had a series of captains that came in, nice people. They left me alone. Everyone was doing their job. They weren't very disruptive. And what happened is that we had a, a confluence of another captain who was a very nice person and meant well, but was you know kind of stumbling into things they shouldn't have been a little bit. And mm -hmm. I realized, hmm, I was like, that, that, anx that anxiety that I'm feeling is familiar. And I told myself, if things get to that point again, because I feel like I'm not being trusted to do my job for whatever reason, even if the intent, the first one, the intent was bad. This one, there was no malintent, but I could feel that coming back up again. And I was like, mm, I remember those days. And I was very sick. Like I was so stressed out. I would go home crying at lunch. I mean, I was a mess during those days back when it first happened. Now I was feeling those same feelings again. I was like, mm, I know these feelings. And it almost killed me the last time. I was like, I'm not doing this. So, so that was kind of bubbling in the background. And I could feel those, those, those things coming back up again. I was like, mm, mm, mm. And mm -hmm. then we had the Las Vegas shooting. So the big shooting in Las Vegas at the concert was on, on October 1st of 2017. So when that shooting happened, um, <clears throat> it's going to make me cry talking about it, but I was at home in bed. Um, it was Sunday night. Chris and I had just gone to bed and my daughter worked at the Luxor. So she worked at one of the restaurants that was open, you know, almost all night at the Luxor and the concert venue was right across the street from that. And I'm in bed, you know, getting ready for bed. It's like 10 30 at night and nothing is happening in the news cycle. Like, it's not like my phone was blowing up because something was going on in the world like it does now. But I get a phone call and my daughter is, you know, upset, crying on the phone. She's like, mom, we have, there's shooters on the strip. I'm, I'm at work and there's people running in the building and they're bloody and they're running and everyone is screaming and there's shooters. So of course, you know, I'm like 20 minutes down the road and like, holy shit, you know, like there's, what am I supposed to do with this? Mm -hmm. So I asked her, I'm like, well, where are you? Like, what are you doing right now? And she said, well, we were hiding in the storeroom. So the back of the store, they had a storage area that could be locked up. And I said, and I said, is it all locked up? Do you barricade the door? Like whatever you need to do. She's like, yep, we're in, we're barricaded. She's like, but people are running and they're bloody. And I was like, how do you know they're running? <laughs> like my brain was just like, how do you see them if you're barricaded? Like I'm testing went, her to make sure she really is science. barricaded. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And she goes, I can see them on the camera. So they had a oh. camera. I was like, okay. I said, well, I said, just stay put. I said, I'm going to, I'm going to make some phone calls. Let me see what I can find out. So I get a hold of my lab director because I figure obviously the police have got to be responding. She's going to know something, right? And nothing's on the news. Nothing's, you know, public at this point in time. And so I call and I find out um, a huge shooting had to do with the concert event. 
So they don't know how many shooters, many people dead on the scene, and they don't know how many people are running around with guns. And the shooter's still out and about. Like, we don't know anything about where he is or what he's doing. So I get a hold of my daughter, and I'm communicating with her. And probably the most terrifying phone call of my life took place during that time. And she calls me and we're talking. And in the meantime, the security people were going through all the little um, uh, restaurants, a little, you know, little like, it's like a food court basically. And they were going through all the food court area, collecting up all the workers, knocking on the store door, like getting them, announcing themselves and bringing them out. And she's like, mom, security's here. And so I can kind of hear them muffling in the background. She's like, okay, they're going to take us down to the basement. So the casinos have huge underground basements where all like the, the employee cafeteria is like all the employee facilities and all that are down underneath the building. And um, she said, uh, we, he need, they need us to follow them out to the basement area where they're collecting all the employees and any other people they can find to, to kind of isolate, get them secured down in the basement of the building. And she's like, you know, she's starting to whisper. She's like, mom, mom, I have to go. Mom, mom, they need us to hang up the phone. Mom, I have to let you go. Mm -mm. Yeah, awful. I said, well, baby, I said, just, I said, do what they tell you to do. I'm like, just keep your head down. Listen, do what they tell you to do, but listen to what's going on around you. I was like, and text me as soon as you get down there, as soon as you get secured in that spot. And she's like, I will, mom. I love you. I was like, oh, girl, I was a hot cake mess. Then um, Elaine, at some point, she texted me and, and said that they'd heard a bomb go off. So my kid is in the basement <laughs> of a mm -hmm. very large building and is hearing reports of a bomb going off. Now, that what happened is the people at the Luxor are obviously everyone that works on the strip. They all kind of know each other, right? It's like its own little microcosm of the world of workers. So the people that work at the Luxor have friends that work at Mandalay Bay and they're communicating with each other. Yeah. And what happened is people at Mandalay Bay heard a huge explosion and were texting their friends that a bomb had gone off at Mandalay Bay. But what it was, it was the flashbang when they went mm -hmm. into the suspect's room. So, but the bomb thing, I actually started- Still terrifying, heaving. yeah. Yeah, I, I was literally dry heaving, like I couldn't stop. <laughs> sure. There was nothing in my stomach, but I was hur like, like I was hurling and not, like nothing was coming up. I was so stressed out. So obviously um you know that situation you know it was what it was and it turned out she was fine but you know i had friends texting me we had um a friend in san diego her daughter was at the concert and had someone throw himself on top of her to shield her from gunfire and he was killed she was found hiding in a closet somewhere one of our officers was shot in the back as he was like getting his friends and family off of the field um, we had friends whose daughter was shot in the shoulder. We had another friend whose kid was shot in the spine. Like it was mm -hmm. like, we were in the community that this affected. And then I had to show up for work the next day. You know, Chris yeah. as well, like Chris, Chris stayed at the coroner's office the next day, helping carry bodies in. I, I kind of sat at work waiting to find out what they needed us for. Um, and then on Tuesday, we went down to the corner, a small crew and I went down to the coroner's office and helped identify uh, some of the victims because the photos weren't working because it was a very high angle that the shots were coming in at. So you had to use fingerprints for a lot of them because photo ID wasn't going to work. So you had, <clears throat> you know, work was getting kind of weird on me. We have this huge incident that affected us professionally and personally, like in many, you couldn't get away from it. Like it was like everywhere all at once. Mm -hmm. And then we had a case, an old homicide case uh, from a few years ago and they decided it was finally going to trial and up until the shooting this case was one of the worst crimes we'd had in las vegas it was awful and they decided to hire outside experts and we knew that we were going to have a huge difficult uh challenging and that we would, they don't do evidentiary hearings often in Las Vegas, but what they do is they make you go through all the questions of an evidentiary hearing in front of the jury. Mm -hmm. And so we had to have this like weeks and weeks of preparatory time to get ready for this extremely big capital murder case on the heels of the shooting. Everything and, going on with everything else. 
everything. And I realized in that moment, so my son was born in 2000. It was 2017, end of 2017. Guess who was turning 18 in January of 2018? <laughs> what fortuitous timing. <laughs> I was like, yeah, because, you know, this whole time again, you know, I've got, you know, my kids are grown pretty much at this point. My son's in his last year of high school. He's turning 18. He's about to graduate, you know, and my business was still flourishing through all of this. I was teaching more than ever. I had more requests than I could handle. And as I went through the paces at work, I realized I was like, I don't, I don't have anything left for you. Like I'm mm -hmm. tapped out. And I need to let some things go here and I enjoy teaching and I enjoy the traveling and my husband, you know, uh, travels with me now. So I have a partner to go with to actually go experience because before I would teach and leave really fast. I would show up, teach, leave. I mean, that was it. I turn around as quickly yeah. as possible. But now we're at a point where, hey, he can come with me and the kids are older and we can we have a dog sitter and we can hang out in whatever city that we're or go see stuff. And um, as busy as my business is, and I am still work a ton of hours, it's because I choose it and mm -hmm. I don't have to constantly solve other people's problems. And, you know, I, I still believe that if they could have given me just like a six month sabbatical, because I'm, as far as I could tell, no one wanted me to leave. Like they were in shock. My staff cried when I told them, like it mm -hmm. was, it was a rough go there because I had just six months prior told them, hey, I'm gonna retire in about five years. We need to talk about who's gonna be taking over. And then like literally a few months later, I said, oh, so not five years, in six weeks. Like I gave Actually them. January. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Not five years, in six weeks I'm retired because I made the decision in early December and um, it was actually on our way back. So we went to uh, San Diego for my birthday and it was over Thanksgiving weekend and because I just needed to like decompress. So with the trial had already taken place, we go down to San Diego and we're waiting on the verdict. So the verdict was due to come back right after we got back. And so as we're on vacation, I'm like relaxing, I'm unwinding a little bit, but I'm like, like, like deflating like a balloon. And we're driving home from San Diego and every mile closer to Vegas, I was getting increasingly upset and then starting to cry and then just didn't want to do it anymore. I was mm -hmm. like, I can't. I can't hold this line anymore. And that's actually the tipping point. And Chris looked at me and he's like, well, your business is doing really well. He's like, just retire, like, just do your business. Yeah. And I was like, it's funny, the tears like I think I will. went right back up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I said, well, let me, I'm emotional right now. Let me sit on this a minute. Let me, yeah. let me take a beat. Let me spend a week thinking about it. But that's when I realized my son is about to turn 18. He's about to graduate. My business is doing great. I can actually teach more variety of classes like like this. I can make this work, you know, like this. And I'm, you know, I'm getting frustrated at work anyway, and I'm feeling overwhelmed. And I was yeah. like, and I realized I'm like, I got, I got nothing left for it. And that's what I told them. I was like, you know, I just, I have nothing left. I can't solve your problems anymore. I'm tapped out. I have no emotional reserve. I have no creative reserve. Yeah. Like there was just no yeah. space to even problem solve in a creative manner. And like I said, if they, just give me six months off to recover from all of this, I probably wouldn't have left. I probably would have stayed, but there's, they don't do that. That's not a thing. Yeah. Right. So that's like, that is not a thing for sure. That's a great idea though. Cause I think a lot of supervisors really could use that time to decompress and they could come back fresh and renewed, but I'm sure, I'm sure when you, made the decision like the decisions that kind of decisions never made lightly so i'm certain there was a lot of fear involved in that and you know finally making that decision that commitment to leave so when you when you did it when you finally left and you're like you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna retire i'm gonna work full time at teaching and training and all of that when when that transition was done how different did that feel for your mental health your anxiety all of that so it was really kind of fascinating so the decision i didn't take it lightly but initially it was a, a huge burden off like i was like i had this initial just like oh like weight lifted 
And it's not that I didn't know what to do with myself. So, so one of the things you people have to consider is when they retire, like I had a business to run. So it's not like I had to come up with things to do. Like, like when my husband retired, he was kind of struggling because he went from being a law enforcement officer for many years to suddenly like not having any responsibilities. But for me, I had responsibilities. I had things to do. So it was very easy for me to just <laughs> refocus my attention on that. So I wasn't like stepping off into a void. My friend's husband just retired from law enforcement and he's experiencing the stepping off into the void thing. I didn't have to worry about that. But if people are retiring and they don't know what they're going to do with themselves, I would just definitely have like a plan, you know, whether it's mm -hmm. hobbies or whatever you're going to get into, you got to have something to fill that time. I didn't have that concern because I already knew that that my business was going to be it. So I went through this kind of period of elation. But then I went into a period and it's of frustration because I started reflecting back on some of the things that took place during my career and reflecting back on like, why were certain things so hard? And you sort of realize that in the moment, you don't understand like, why is this so difficult? And when I compared my experiences to other managers in the unit, there seemed to be a clear divide between the male supervisors and the female supervisors and expectations and mm -hmm. ability to affect change. Like, I feel like the, I was the longest serving manager there. I never made bad choices. Like I was always making good decisions, but if I offered up change because I wanted something, I thought it could be better a different way. I had to actually demonstrate, like I had to go back and do a bunch of research and present all the data. I had to spend weeks preparing to give this mm -hmm. idea and have all the ammunition in place. Because if I didn't, what I'd already learned is I would be dismissed because it happened before. I, when I was first started, I would make suggestions and I knew it was the right path, but I would get written off and I would have to go do the research, come back to another meeting and then present all the data, even though I already knew the data was there. I just didn't have it organized in a way that I could put it in someone's face. And then I realized how much time I spent doing that throughout my career. And I would watch male supervisors walk into a meeting, not prepared, no data, no nothing, and just give an idea. And everyone would be like, oh, yeah, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> so, it's so true. <laughs> so I went through this, like, period of anger. Like, I was like, I could have done so much more if they hadn't forced me to waste my time doing all of that because I had to do all of that on top of being the tech lead, on top of being the manager, like on top of all the other responsibilities. And I, I was sort of mad about that for a little while. Like I went from <laughs> elation to anger yeah. to, it's like the stages of grief. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I just got to a place where I got over it, but it wasn't like that first eight, like I think it was coming down off the stress. It was like, you're running at this level for years, all 12 candles are burning in the wind. And then all of a sudden it's foof. And then all of a sudden mm -hmm. you kind of do this for a little while. And then you're like, oh, okay, I'm all right. It's I'm over mm -hmm. it. Like, whatever, like good on you. Yeah. Next person can deal with it. I'm not going to worry about it. So, um, but it's <laughs> so took, true, but it took me a hot minute and it took me like 18 months to go through. So when you leave, it's not, I mean, I hope when people leave, they just do this and they walk away. I think I was so emotionally invested in my job that it wasn't that easy for me. I wish it had yeah. been that easy. So my greatest hope is that when you walk away, you just like throw all that out and it's done and it's gone. You're like, bye. <laughs> but be prepared. It, I thought it would be that way. And it turned out I went through this for a while and then I hit my stride. Yeah. You know, it's going to be different depending on how you're wired, how, you know, emotional, how you respond to things. Like so many things impact that final feeling as you walk away. But the one thing that has been consistent since the day I left is I have had no regrets. Yay, no regrets. <laughs> so for all of our supervisors out there watching, if they're kind of coming to that point where they do feel like, hey, I really am. I, I All of 12 of my wicks are burning. I'm really feeling, you know, overwhelmed. I'm feeling, you know, very anxious about going to work. I'm really riding that fence about deciding, you know, should I 
retire? Should, what can I change? Should I change jobs? Should I change departments? Should I step down? Like all of those thoughts are going through their mind. Do you Mm -hmm. have any suggestions for them to kind of help them, you know, make a decision or, you know, any suggestions for them at all to, to move forward with, you know, whatever path they're going to choose. Right. And it's, gosh, so, so, so much of that depends on like, is the situation temporary? Like, is it just like you're getting ready for accreditation and it's going to be really rough for six months as you get prepared for accreditation? Or is it you've got a trainee and it's just sort of, you know, painful as you train people? Or is it that you constantly have, let's say, trainees and you're constantly in training mode and you're so burnt out about it and there's no relief in sight? So, you know, a lot of that depends on the work situation, you know, or like for me, was it a captain that I knew they rotate out relatively quickly, so I'm not going to worry about it? Or are the feelings coming back in such a way that is it's unmanageable? So I think a lot of things have to play into that. But most importantly, you know, are you financially secure? So a lot of that decision is going to be based on your financial situation. I mean, at the end of the day, we work to support our families. Mm -hmm. and ourselves. So, you know, what can you do in your life to continue to maintain whatever life you want? You have to make those decisions sometimes financially. So if it seems like no end in sight at your agency, but you still have to keep working, then perhaps another job if, and then it depends on how far you're willing to move. So I Mm -hmm. think there's a lot of moving parts that go into that. But if you are financially stable, If you can't afford to retire, you literally, you know, run all the numbers and it's going to be fine. My thing is some people don't retire because they're afraid to. Yes. I would say don't, don't be afraid. (laughs) Yeah. Every person that I know that financially was in a situation where they could leave every time they leave. And my friend that used to work with me, um, she worked for me. She uh, just retired earlier this year when she finally retired in January. She could have retired two years ago, a year ago, easily. When she finally pulled the plug in January, one of the first things she said to me about two months is, about two months into retirement is she said, I can't believe I waited this long. I could have done this a year ago. (laughs) There's so much of that going on too. I mean, there's, I do think there's this, this huge fear of stepping into the unknown and releasing this thing that you've been you know, you've dedicated so much of your life and time to, and uh, we we actually had a, a sheriff. He was a sheriff for a very long time, very beloved sheriff, and he was putting off retirement, putting off retirement, and then when he finally retired, when he came back, he said, um, like, just for events and stuff like that, he said that retirement, like, was like the Wizard of Oz and his his whole career was in black and white. And then when he retired, everything turned into color and he didn't know oh my why gosh. he hadn't retired sooner. <laughs> and it's so true. Like I've heard so many stories about that. Like once the once they yeah. finally step into retirement, they're like, wow. And the stress and like, um, you know, we had a supervisor who was taking medication every night to be able to sleep because she was very, very stressed and anxious. And as soon yes. as she retired, all of that goes away. <laughs> like people lose weight and like all these amazing things that happen when they finally, you know, get over that fear yep. and, and make that decision to step into retirement. So Right. And what's interesting, I'm and I'm glad you brought the medication thing. I know so many, particularly female supervisors and managers. Mm-hmm. who are taking medication so they can absorb more stress. Mm-hmm. And I thought about that because I was talking to some of my girlfriends and I was like, wow, like I didn't do that, which is probably why part of the reason it was so hard on me. Yes. <laughs> but I just suffered it. And I don't know why I chose that instead of taking medication. But I have many friends who did. And then I kind of thought to myself, isn't it interesting that that in many cases we will medicate ourselves to to stress ourselves so we can tolerate more stress Mm -hmm. and our first response often isn't you know what i can't handle this i'm gonna do less so like i don't know if that's like the people pleasing kind of side of things it's like i will continue to sacrifice my body to um to do more 
Um, and I'll take meds that will allow me to do more rather than say, you know what, this is my physical mental limits. And, you know, we have to rearrange job structure here or something um, mm -hmm. that that's often, very often the go to response. And then, yeah, it makes sense that when you retire and all of a sudden you're like, wait a second, you know, <laughs> I didn't even need I any didn't... of this. <laughs> it's so yeah, true. What you, needed, what you needed were reasonable expectations. Yes. <laughs> and Preach. and the ability to <laughs> to set boundaries and not yes. be punished for setting the boundaries because women often get punished when they set a boundary. And that's yep. kind of part of the part of the difference in management. And so um it bleeds into crazy ways. Crazy ways. Yep. So Completely yeah, I appreciate agree. all of that. All of that. Completely <laughs> agree. <clears throat> so this has been amazing. Do you have any last thoughts for our supervisors out there watching? So for many supervisors, and I was I kind of thought this way too, I, I viewed my position as a supervisor as a support person. So I really did. I mean, you're a leader, but you're also support. And one of the early mistakes that I made as a manager is, especially with new people coming in, because of just kind of how I'm wired, my employee's success became my success and my employees failures became, became my failures so when i had an employee that wasn't performing well it destroyed me like it was very hard on me like if i had a trainee that wasn't making it through the training program and yes. so it was it was this like synergy this codependence that their successes and failures were my personal successes and failures that led to a lot of my burnout and it wasn't until I started being able to grow up, <laughs> I could say, and realize that I had a good, strong training program. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the training program. Like if it was the training program, I would have been, and, and it modified as I went along and I updated it and I updated it. But whenever someone wasn't performing well, I had a tendency to blame myself and look in myself for what I needed to do to fix. Mm -hmm. And I finally realized in a way it was a lack of confidence in my, in my leadership ability and my management and my training program and, you know, my, you know, performances. Like I always took it as my fault for some reason, or just, you know, is what it is. Well, as I got further into my career, when I learned that, no, I'm actually a good manager, I am a good leader and I have a really good training program that is affording them all the opportunities. Like I've extended myself as far as I can. And it's been good. Like other people are doing just fine. Like, like mm -hmm. it's not the training program and to allow other people to take responsibility for their contribution to that. And then if they couldn't make it to understand that it wasn't me because I had done yeah. the work um, yeah. and that, you know, they, their failures and success, as long as I am being very open with them about what they need to do with giving them clear guidance, clear goals, clear expectations. And I like couldn't have made it any clearer <laughs> than what I had is that I done my work. Now, granted, I had to make mistakes in order to get to that point. But mm -hmm. the minute I was able to separate that and say, this is this part's yours and this part's mine and I'll own mine, but you got to own yours. I will say that that brought my stress level down quite a bit. And it's just that tremendous internal pressure we put on ourselves. And so I realized that a lot of it was self-induced because I, I was too like codependent, I guess I would say, with my uh, success of my employees. And I had to detach that a bit. And I think though, as a, as a woman, that's kind of hard to do. So um, we need to be mindful, especially of our tendency to be supportive but sometimes too helpful in the process and that we can even help ourselves with bringing some of that anxiety down if we learn to spin some things back onto people for their responsibilities. But I will tell you, it took me 10 years. So I was a supervisor, well, not so quite great. 10 years, I would say eight years. It took me eight years to figure that out. And then I managed yes. that for like seven years, but then things got too bad again. And I was like, okay, I'm out. <laughs> So great. I, I literally feel like we could talk about this stuff all day. 
Right. Sorry. This is probably more than 15 minutes worth of material. No, I love it. I love it. I like every, <laughs> everything you're talking about. I'm like, Ooh, and this and that and this, but yes, I'm these speaking, are... I'm speaking your love language. I'm speaking your love I, language. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I feel all of these things. I think a lot of the people watching will also feel all of these things. So, um, but I so much appreciate your time today before we actually check off. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about Evolve Forensics, what you do and what they can find if they visit your website? <clears throat> oh, thank you. My company sort of morphed names a couple times, but it's been settled on Evolve Forensics for about the last eight years. And it really is mostly training. So I do a lot of still very basic examiner uh, training. I do on-site training. And then with COVID, I had to convert my entire business model over to online. So for two years, webinars live. So we're on camera or not really on camera because I'm usually in my PJs, but you're live with me <laughs> on my uh, on my fancy microphone system here. And yes. uh, we go through uh, <laughs> and we do webinars. And then also now I'm back on-site training. I do, I've picked up a little bit of casework here and there, not a lot because I'm just so busy with the training aspect of it because that's what I love to do. And so if they go to Evolve Forensics, they'll see that I have one website, evolveforensics.com, which is the on-site training. And then I have that leads you to a second website, learn.evolveforensics.com, which is uh, all the webinars. And so um, I have classes that are already kind of the, on, the, on the book, so to speak, but we also do some customized training as well. So that's, that's kind of what I do now. That's my shtick. And uh, I get lots of emails from people to help with questions and you know, random stuff. So I just sort of a, just a resource basically for a lot of folks just on the side. And then otherwise uh, my bread and butter is just through the training process. Amazing. Amazing. So we will drop the link for her website below. So if you guys want to reach out to Alice or to check out any of her classes, she offers a lot of amazing <laughs> training content for latent print examiners out there. So thank you so much for being with us today, Alice. Oh, you're welcome. And we hope you guys have a great rest of the time at the summit. Bye. All right. We hope you enjoyed this bonus episode of the Forensics Unfiltered podcast. Just a reminder, if you want instant access to this guest interview and over 30 more presentations like it, get the all-access pass at gapscience.teachable.com. The link is waiting for you in the show notes. Thank you so much for being here and listening to Forensics Unfiltered. If you liked this episode, would you do us a favor and leave a review letting us know specifically what you liked about this topic? It will only take a minute, but it will really help us plan future episodes so we can bring you more topics that you want to listen to. We'll be sure to provide any links from today's episode in our show notes on our website. Head to www.gapscience.com. Until next time, stay safe out there.